Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Not so many people this morning, but maybe on Sunday morning it's normal. Eh? So, welcome. Uh, our first speaker of today will be Claire Giordano, who is working in the Microsoft team on the Postgres things. And she's from Status Data. Can you say that all again with a much louder voice? Stephanie's but going sorry. crazy back there. All right. I have to scream a little bit more. Uh, so, Claire Giordano from Microsoft team, from Citus Data, uh, working uh, on Postgres, and amazing speaker. So, give her a hard welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, how many of you have been to the Postgres dev room before um, at FOSDEM here? Okay. And for how many of you is it your first time? All right, so more first timers. What I will tell you is last year, the first talk of the day did have fewer people just like this. I don't know what the problem is with 10 o'clock in the morning, but apparently there's a problem at FOSDEM. Um, and then by the second or third talk, the room which fit 300 people was full. So if you're here and you're interested in staying, I recommend you keep your seat um, because it should fill up as the day progresses. Um, so my name is Claire Giordano, and I'm here to talk to you today about Fibonacci spirals and 21 ways to contribute to Postgres uh, beyond code. So before we start, I want to put a face to the name. And this man had lots of names. Leonardo Pisano Biglo, Leonardo of Pisa, Leonardo Bonacci. And it turns out that Fibonacci was actually his nickname. And it means literally son of Bonacci. And oh my gosh, did I pronounce all those names properly? Fibonacci. Fibonacci. Yeah. Fibonacci. Okay, I should have asked for your help on this first slide. Thank you. We have a real Italian sitting here in the front row. Um, so he was, as most of you know, a 12th century Italian mathematician. Uh, now, the sequence you're probably also familiar with, but what most people don't know is that Fibonacci did not discover the Fibonacci sequence. It actually first appeared in writings in India hundreds of years before Fibonacci's time. And he traveled extensively in the Middle East, and when he came back, he wrote a book called Liber Abaci. Did I say that right? Close enough. And, um, and that book was all about the mathematical methods of commerce. And it had two major impacts on the world. Um, the first is that it really popularized the Hindu and Arabic number systems because at that point in time, they were still using Roman numerals where Fibonacci was from. And the second impact was the Fibonacci sequence. And in the book, he posed this question, and I have to read it to make sure I get it right. Um, and the question was about, does anyone know what the question was about? Somebody tell me. OK, it was about rabbits. So, if a pair of rabbits is placed in an enclosed area, how many rabbits will be born if we assume that every month a pair of rabbits will produce another pair and that rabbits begin to bear young two months after birth? That seemingly innocuous rabbit question leads to this very powerful Fibonacci sequence. So the title of this talk, though, has to do with Fibonacci spirals. So I figured I'd better show you all how to create a Fibonacci spiral. So if you create a tile for each number in the sequence that's a square, so uh, 1 by 1, 2 by 2, 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 8 by 8, and so on, you see that the tiles all connect together really elegantly. And then if you put a quarter turn of a circle inside each of those squares, you create this beautiful green Fibonacci spiral that you see on the screen. And uh, it is closely related to the golden spiral, but I'm not going to talk about the golden spiral in this talk or the differences between them. So let's not go there. All right, so what do Fibonacci spirals have to do with contributing to Postgres? Well, as I was conceiving this talk, I started to think about all the different types of contributions that can help drive the adoption of Postgres on the planet. So if we're looking to increase the number of users, the number of developers, the number of pull requests, the number of um, consultants that work in this space, uh, the uh, number of applications that are running on top of Postgres, well, uh, I, I had to figure out what kind, of, how much adoption we wanted to drive. Did we want to drive exponential adoption? Did we want to drive Fibonacci adoption and see a Fibonacci curve, which is what you see here, right? This is the Fibonacci sequence plotted with a linear y-axis. And so that's where the idea for Fibonacci connecting in with this talk might have come from. 
or it might have come from the fact that I just always wanted to put a Romanesco <laughs> cauliflower in one of my talks. Now, how many of you have seen, touched, or eaten one of these? Okay, so uh, less than half the room. These things are super cool. I think they're mathematically beautiful. They are Fibonacci spirals, um, and in fact, they're also fractals. So they're kind of a double whammy of mathematical beauty in one vegetable. And it turns out that there are Fibonacci spirals all over in nature, in snail shells, for example, in artichokes, underneath pine cones, in the arrangement of the bracts on the bottom of pine cones. Those are all Fibonacci spirals. And sunflowers, um, in the arrangement of the seeds on the top of the sunflower flower, that, those are Fibonacci spirals too. And I'm even told that you can see Fibonacci in the arrangement of pigeons on rooftops and how they line up on the rooftops. Now, this part's not true, and you can thank Dimitri Fontaine for having me add it to the talk. And last time I did this, a lot more people laughed. So thank you for the people in the front row who chuckled at that. Okay, but this part's not true. Don't, don't remember this part. All right. So... 21 ways to contribute to Postgres. This is why we're here. We're here to talk about Postgres. And really quickly, why do I have anything to contribute or say on this topic? Um, I started my career as a developer at Sun Microsystems in the developer tools group. And um, over the course of my career, I've worn lots of different hats. I've contributed in many different ways. I spent the bulk of my career as an engineering manager in the kernel group at Sun Microsystems back when there was Sun Microsystems, and uh, I've also, just over 10 years ago, moved into product management and product marketing roles. So I've, I've seen these contributions come from different angles, and in fact, when I moved from engineering over to product marketing, there were people, friends of mine, who frankly questioned me and my choices, and they felt like the work I was doing was somehow less important now. And uh, so let me ask you this. Those of you in the room, have any of you ever worked in a small software company, a small startup or a small firm? Raise of hands, please. Wow, more than half of you. Okay, so one of my lessons working in a small company is that it's like you're all in the boat, you're out in the middle of the ocean, and you're all pulling on the oars and doing whatever it is your role is, and we all need each other. Every role matters whether it's the person ordering toilet paper for the bathroom so you have toilet paper when customers come to visit, or the developers, uh, the people in finance making sure all the numbers work. Salespeople matter a lot if you're trying to make money. Um, and if our goal is to delight our customers, we all have to work together. So that's why there's this emphasis on beyond code, which is what the next slide um, goes ahead to ask. To, to pose. I've already answered this question. The other thing I should point out is that um, I joined Citus Data three years ago, and Citus's claim to fame is we've created an open source extension to Postgres called Citus that scales out Postgres horizontally. And the reason the Microsoft logo is there, was we got acquired a year ago. And so I now work for Microsoft, which 10 years ago, I don't know how I would have exactly felt about that. Um, but uh, these days, I'm actually quite happy with the company that Microsoft is growing up to become. So I'm, I'm pleased, and I'm happy there, and I'm still there. All right, so we talked about why Beyond Code. And now I just want to tell you that when I was submitting my talk proposal for the CFP, I did a quick search at the very last minute. I had it all ready to go, and then I had this little paranoid thought of, uh-oh, what if someone just did this? What if someone just did this earlier this year? I better check. So I did a few Google searches, and sure enough, Josh Burkus um, delivered a talk back in 2013 called 50 Ways to Love Your Project. So those of you who um, don't know Josh, he was on the core team for Postgres for many years. Now he has emeritus status. I always mispronounce that word. And uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to him because I definitely, once I discovered his talk, I went and studied his, his slides and um, made sure to um, incorporate it. And I wanted to say thank you. And it's been seven years. So it seemed time to have the conversation again and make more people aware of all the types of ways you can contribute to Postgres to make it successful. And now we're just going to dive in, 21 ways. Um, the first way is, obviously, let's start with the brain-dead obvious, attend conferences. You guys are all here at FOSDOM, so you get that. What 
some people don't get, though, is that when you go to a conference, of course you're focused on what you can learn, what you can get out of it. And what you don't always realize is that you're impacting the people that you're talking to in the hallway track. Let's say the two of you meet for the first time and you have a conversation and you share some tip that changes your work when you go back um, to whatever your project is next week. That happens all the time, and it's super powerful. So that participation uh, matters a lot. That sharing matters a lot. Um, the second way is just an extension, if you will, or a smaller local um, example of sharing at conferences. There are lots of ways to participate in local meetups. Uh, does anybody recognize this picture? Did anyone? You do. Where is that? Um, I think it's at the K it's in Amsterdam, it's the KPN office. I'm, just, I'm wearing the blue shirt with, with the laptop. Got it. So you're in the picture. You're now famous. Yes. Got it. So this is um, uh, the uh, PostgreSQL meetup in the Netherlands. Um, thank you to Boris and the people at Optima Data for helping me uh, track down the photo. I particularly like the green floor because I've never worked in an office space that has a football field that you can play around in. You know, where I work in California, we have ping pong tables in the office, but we've never quite had the turf to play to play football. And of course, we don't even call it football in the states, but. Let's not go there and use the other term. Um, so there's obvious ways to participate in meetups, attend, give talks, um, give feedback to speakers. Speakers love feedback. We want to get better. We want to add value. And so if you ever have an idea about something that somebody didn't mention or a related point, give them that feedback. Um, but there's some non-obvious ways to contribute to meetups, too. Um, so if you or your company are in a position to host a meetup like the folks here were, that is a great and valuable thing to do. Um, the other thing um, the organizers always appreciate are when people chip in to help pay for food and drink for the evening evening um, because their attendees tend to appreciate food and drink. So that's another way. All right, number three, you can share your expertise by giving a conference talk, just like so many people are doing here at FOSDEM. Um, I had to put this picture up here because their CFP just opened a couple of days ago. So this is um, Postgres Ibiza, which um, this year will happen in June, and it will be the second year that it happens. Uh, it's called Postgres on the Beach. And I've had a few debates with people about whether Postgres on the Beach is a real conference or whether it's what we call in English a boondoggle. Do you all know what a boondoggle is? It's, it's kind of like a, a, a business trip that where there's not so much business, and it's really more play. Um, it turns out this is a very serious conference, and I was talking to one of my um, teammates, Dimitri Fontaine, and he went last year, and he said it's absolutely one of the best conferences that he's ever been to. So um, heads up about that CFP. I think there's also a CFP. F oh, you went also last year. So Maboob was there last year, and you can vouch for it as well? Okay. Um, they're expecting to grow this year and have an even bigger following. I think there are other CFPs that are open right now for Postgres, if that's something you've ever considered. Um, sharing your expertise and your lessons matters. You do not have to be a developer who works on Postgres. You do not have to be a contributor or a committer to have something valuable to share. In fact, user stories can make some of the best um, presentations. So whether you're an app developer or a DBA, um, your experience using Postgres is is also worth sharing. I think PG Day Austria's CFP is also open right now. Am I missing any other ones? Oh, PG Day IT is open. Um, so there are a Germany. Germany. That's right. And is Belgium open yet? Not yes. yet, but soon. Okay. All right. So you can go to the PostgresQL.org website. They have a list of upcoming community events, and it's from there you can track down um, what's opening up. All right. And uh, Devram, I have to keep looking at my slides because they're not displaying here. So just apologizing to you. I know that's your pet peeve. You don't like people to turn back. Um, number four, um, post your slides online. If you do give a talk at a meetup, maybe something in your, um, with your team, and it's not confidential and it can be shared, I cannot emphasize enough the value of posting your slides online. By the way, those of you who are on the edges, squish into the middle if you see some seats next to you because people are filling in here. So please, just get up, squish in, make space. Move, move right. Yeah, move towards the brick wall over here. Uh, thank you very much for accommodating. This room is going to be full. Thank you, Joe. All right. Uh, 
of the number of digital views that you get for posting your slides online will often exceed the number of people in the room. Even if you have 300 people in the room, um, it, you'll still get more digital views online in almost all cases. Um, this is a picture of a, a talk I gave last year in Switzerland, um, and this is on Speaker Deck, which happens to be my favorite, but there's lots of other slide sharing services that you can share your, your slides on. And of course, the conference sites will always ask you, well, often will ask you for it, and they'll post it on their websites too. Most of us do that, but some people don't do it. Absolutely, get those digital views, share your expertise with people who couldn't afford to, in this case, make the trip to FOSDEM and come here to Brussels. All right, so then the other way you could contribute is to start a local PG Day. Um, I put this picture of PG Day Paris's logo up here because it is happening in March. Um, and it's happening two days after a wonderful PG Day in the Nordics, which this year is in Helsinki, Finland. So I went to Nordic last year. It was in Copenhagen, and I felt privileged to be able to give a different talk there. Um, but Paris has a, a warm place in my heart. I went to school in France many years ago, and so I had to mention that. Um, the thing about PG Days that's so special is they're single track, one-day events. And so that has a couple of interesting benefits. One is that um, they're just easier to get to. Typically, you don't have to travel as far to get to them. And you don't have to miss as much work, because it's only a day. And it's also less expensive, because you don't have to travel as far, and you don't have to miss as much work. And then it's intimate. Like, unlike today, where some of you will change rooms throughout the day and maybe be sitting next to a stranger the entire day, you can walk through a whole day at FOSDEM and not meet anybody. I know from experience that that's possible, and it can be lonely. Um, when you're in a, an intimate kind of one room, one day conference, you're with the same people all day, and you're way more likely to meet people and build contacts that you stay in touch with afterwards. So for me, at least, that's been my experience, and um, other friends of mine have said that too. I wanted to highlight PG Day Santiago because Boris Mejias, who was in the room a while ago and, and left, he's not here to watch my talk, um, but he first told me about PG Day Santiago, and it was a brand new PG Day that happened last fall in Chile, and um, what I thought was so cool about it is it's the only PG Day I know of that was completely 100% in the local language. So it was all in Spanish, catering to the language and the interests of that local Postgres community, and I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, and then PG Day SF is something much closer to home. I'm from California. I live outside of San Francisco. And I actually helped to create PG Day SF, working with an awesome team of people across different companies. And it just happened two weeks ago. So it's still fresh. We'll be doing the postmortem in about a week, excuse me, the retrospective. We don't say postmortem anymore. And we'll be doing the retrospective in about um, a week's time once I'm back in the States. And uh, it's a ton of work to create one of these PG days, I got to tell you. I was on the talk selection committee for it, which was quite a privilege. Uh, but it's also very rewarding when you're there and you see people meeting for the first time and exchanging email addresses and phone numbers and um, talking about job opportunities or walking away with something from a talk that they didn't know about before. So it's pretty cool as an organizer to see that happen. All right, another way, number six. You can write a blog or post an article. Uh, now, how many of you write blogs about using Postgres or working on Postgres? Raise of hands. OK, just a few of you. All right, thank you. Um, well, it's, and I don't know why that's not showing. It pisses me off, quite frankly. Well, that's okay. Those words don't matter. Um, I took a picture of something Leticia Avro, who's one of the bouncers outside. She's volunteering today. So she's standing right outside that door. But she wrote an article for the Programme magazine in France and actually made the cover which I thought was pretty darn cool. So that's why I used an article instead of a blog. But it's cool because you can reach so many more people digitally when you do that. Um, all right, let's go forward. So if you do write blogs, then I absolutely recommend that you syndicate to Planet Postgres. Now, how many of you have syndicated blog posts you've written to Planet Postgres? Please raise your hands. OK, I know Joe wants to raise his hand. Stephen did in the back. OK, awesome. Thank you, Devram. Um, this is really powerful. 
Uh, I have published blogs. My team writes a lot of blogs about Postgres and open source and Citus. And uh, when we syndicate to Planet Postgres, and there's a policy for doing this, it has to be about Postgres. It has to be relevant. Um, no spam, of course. Uh, but we reach a lot of people. Planet Postgres has a nice um, Twitter following. And if you don't follow it yet, 20,000 people and me all follow it, and you should definitely join in. I learn all sorts of interesting things that are going on across the various companies that work in this space. Uh, and if you don't use Twitter, uh, you can always go to the postgresql.org website and you scroll down a bit, and there's a section on there called Planet Postgres, which has, um, you can, at the bottom of it, you can click to the archives, and that's how you can get to the RSS feed that exists for it. Um, and you can also get to, on the right hand column, the policies and how to get started. If you are writing about Postgres and you want to syndicate, all those instructions are available there. All right, number eight, you could write a book. So um, I talked to Dimitri about how he wrote this book, The Art of Postgres. Um, and he said that if you find yourself in the Postgres world constantly answering the same question over and over, or that people are constantly asking the same questions over and over, that maybe there's a book there. Maybe there's a, a, a series of questions you could collate together into some structure and publish it and reach even more people. And I, how many of you have read or bought The Art of Postgres. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, that's awesome. Um, I have not read it yet. It is in English, um, and, but I've heard from people that it's awesome. And um, when he found out I was going to be putting a big graphic of his book here today, um, he agreed to give me a discount code. So those of you who do want to get it, you can use Claire15 uh, to get 15% off on any edition of the book. He has paper editions, what he calls the dead tree editions, as well as digital versions. And you can just go to theartofpostgresql.com in order to track that down. So, And the slides are already published, so if you forget, you can look it up later. Um, here's another book by Marcus Winand. This is the German edition, Sequel Performance Explained. How many of you have used or read or consulted with this book? All right, so about another almost 10 people. Um, one of my colleagues said that in her first year as a developer working on Postgres, this was her Bible. It was incredibly valuable to help her understand how to optimize her queries for performance reasons. So she highly recommended it, and I just thought I would feature it. And you can find it at sql-performance-explained.com. And again, these slides are already public. OK, so the next thing you can do is to create user stories. Now, you don't have to work for a Postgres company like I do to want to create customer stories or case studies. Um, Plenty of users will write blog posts on their own engineering blogs about their experience uh, migrating their app to Postgres or improving the performance running on Postgres. And those stories are valuable too. I suspect a lot of you in this room probably have insights into how people are using Postgres. And for people who are considering it, that stuff is gold. It's pure gold. So it's worth the effort. Now, the reason I put a picture here of a man holding a big light up high above a stage where people are getting ready to do a performance is because I feel like when you're creating a user story, um, you have that same kind of power. I mean, this guy sitting here, he's going to control what the audience sees. Where he shines the light is what their attention is going to be focused on. And the order in which he moves the light from this corner to that corner to the middle affects the audience experience. And so I, when I've created user stories, that's how I often perceive of it, is I'm that, that lighting technician that's figuring out what matters and what um, people considering Postgres want to know about and want to learn about. Um, if you do this, I have two tips for you. Uh, whether you work on your own open source project or for a company, um, don't ever, ever outsource the interview with the end user. Um, because then you have people just reading off of standard templates of questions, and they don't necessarily get to the interesting meat. And th frankly, sometimes they're bored because they can tell the person interviewing them doesn't know anything about the topic. Um, the other tip I have is a lot of writers that you might hire, freelancers, to help you write the story, um, their tendency is to take something really colorful, maybe something politically incorrect or idiomatic, that these words that people have used, and they try to make it generic and vanilla 
and standard and you know reaching everybody and that makes the stories really boring so don't do that either try to keep your stories as authentic as possible to the way actual users talk about it all right number 10 um, you can use video to um, help show what Postgres can do. Um, and the reason for that is some people just learn better with video, right? Some of us are great with books. We're book smart, right? And we're great reading articles, reading documentation to figure out what we need to do. But other people need to see a demo. They need to see a screencast. I need to increase my voice. All right, is that better, Stephanie? Okay. We're good. Um, this is just a picture of a video I helped to produce with Marco Slot in the Netherlands um, last year. So I just wanted to put an example up there as a way of leading you to the next topic, which is if you do create these small bite-sized videos, like not longer than five minutes, please, because nobody wants to watch videos that are longer than five minutes, um, just making sure you have really good video metadata matters. It matters for people's discoverability of it. And so um, don't just include your title and your abstract, but also try to put a couple video bookmarks in there that will link to that special spot in the middle, which you think people are really going to care about. And just think, if somebody's watched your entire screencast and then they read the entire description and they're hungry for more, be sure to put some other links at the bottom, which I don't know if you can see in the back there, um, but just put a little green check mark next to them, link to whatever they can get to next so they can keep learning more about whatever your open source project is or whatever your product is. All right, number 11. If you build it, they will not come. But boy, oh boy, am I so happy for the word of mouth that surrounds FOSDEM because all of you are here today. So thank you for coming. And um, by the way, if you do see an empty spot next to you, please, after he's done, squish over so you make more space. Um, you have to promote what you've created. So whether you create videos or blog posts or new extensions, maybe you've created a new repo on GitHub, um, you do have to make people aware of it. What I found is that people in my inner circle, you know, the people I work with every day, maybe who sit next to me, um, some of them are super helpful to also help me share, spread the word, and some of them don't want to help. Some of them just aren't comfortable doing that. They feel like it's too self-promotional when they work really closely with me. And so what I've experienced is it's my secondary network, like friends of friends or acquaintances who are even more generous and help spread the word and create word of mouth around whatever projects I'm working on, which I think is fabulous. All right, so now promote on Twitter. How many of you use Twitter? Okay, so about half of you. Um, I think it's an incredibly great place to learn about Postgres. Um, there are a bunch of accounts like Planet Postgres that I mentioned earlier. This is a picture of the at PostgresQL Twitter feed, which is the community Twitter feed um, that went live, I think, sometime about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and so I think there's almost 16,000 followers here now. If you're not following it yet, this is a great place to hear about the latest announcements of Postgres. But if you work with Postgres, one way to contribute is to share some of your learnings and your epiphanies and your perspectives and your lessons on Twitter. If you just read a great article that you're recommending to the person next to you on your project, why not tweet about it and include that link and let people know? And again, that helps to spread the word and feed this whole growing ecosystem. And I think you all know that Postgres is growing. Last, this is a small room this year. Last year we had a room that sat 300, and we filled it by the second and third talks of the day. So, um, and what, DB Engine's database of the year, two years in a row, but not this year, unfortunately. Um, but there's lots of evidence of some significant growth in this space. Um, this might be, number 13, the most important thing you can do to help contribute to the growth of Postgres, which is that when you're working in this space, say thank you. I don't think I do this enough. I think lots of us don't do this enough. Um, if you like somebody's work, praise it. And especially if they're junior, especially if they're new, especially if they're, they're stumbling along and making the mistakes that we all make, especially when we were new. Uh, I put this example of a tweet up there from a Postgres engineer named Louise Grandjean, who lives in Paris. And she had gone to a meetup in New York City and saw Sam Bale's talk and really, really liked it on foreign data wrappers. And so instead of 
It's, it would have been wonderful if she had just gone up to Sam and said, that was great, I really appreciated this part and this part, and I'm going to use them in my job this week. But she went even further and tweeted about it and kind of raised awareness, probably drove a bunch more followers for Sam on Twitter, and recommend that, recommended that people go to Sam's talk at the next um, conference where Sam was presenting. And I thought that was a very generous gift. And I think we, we just need to help each other. And one of the benefits is that when that person in this case, Sam, is having a bad day or running into obstacles, well, they have this and all these positive experiences to fall back on. All right, number 14. How many of you know that the messages to Postgres are translated? Okay, a small number. I felt like seven hands, eight hands went up. Um, I didn't know that either in the beginning. I think it's awesome. There's a whole bunch of people who are actively working on translating the Postgres messages into all sorts of languages. And this is a screenshot of a website called, called get this, Bobble dot postgresql.org. I put the URL right over there on the right. Um, it's of the current status. I took the screenshot last night. And um, if any of you speak multiple languages, which I'm guessing, let's just ask that question. How many of you speak more than English? OK, there you go. I knew I was in the right place. That is absolutely a way that you can contribute. And if you're just getting started with Postgres and you want to make a contribution now, but maybe you're not ready to do it in some other areas, this is a great way to get started. So um, there are instructions in the Postgres documentation about how translators can do it. And there's no code involved. Uh, it's weird. On the wiki, it's called national language support. And on the documentation, it's called native language support. So I don't know. Just It's native language support in the documentation. You can Google for that there and find it. Uh, but this is an awesome way to help. Now, another way to help is to report bugs with Postgres. This is super valuable. Um, I know there's a tendency among human beings to sometimes feel like someone's already reported this bug. I can't be the first one to run into this. This is so obvious that probably hundreds of people have already reported it. I don't need to report it. But absolutely, you should because you don't know that, and oftentimes other people haven't reported it. Um, the turnaround time in the PostgreSQL team for fixing things is pretty impressive. I have been told of instances where bugs were literally fixed within an hour of having been reported. Uh, more likely, it'll be considered as a candidate for the next patch release. Patch releases are every quarter, and then the major releases for Postgres are every year. So. You know, if it's something sizable and impact, maybe it would be a candidate for a major release. But people feel in the core team and um, in the contributor community that these bug reports are gold, and we absolutely want people to do it. So how do you um, submit bug reports? Where do you submit them? Well, you could just send an email to the mailing list, and it's um, pgsql bugs um, on the mailing list. That's one option. You can also fill out a form. Uh, that I think I don't show a picture of, um, but you can fill out a form um, that you can find on the web page, and it will in turn mail the mailing list. Now, there is a very important caveat, and Joe is looking at me. He's got his eyes looking at me right now, so I, I think he's hoping that I'm going to say this. If the bug has security implications of any kind, then you probably don't want to report it using that process. Don't use the mailing list and don't use the form because that effectively makes it public. If there are security implications, you can check the documentation and you'll find that you should mail it more privately to security at PostgreSQL.org. Got it? Is that good? Get a thumbs up on that one? All right. Very important. All right. Number 16. Submit corrections to documentation. I have talked to some pretty serious Postgres engineers where this is the very first way that they participated and contributed to the community. And it can be as simple as a typo. That's worth fixing. Because, um, you know, when there are typos, people think maybe the rest of the, you know, the technology might have um, mistakes in it. And so we like to fix those. Um, my thing that I tend to notice is a lot of times people will use language that seems super clear can only be understood in one way. But in fact, it's ambiguous. And there are multiple interpretations for it. So if you see any ambiguities, by all means, submit corrections to them so that we can get those things um, fixed. And of course, if there's anything in the documentation that makes you hit your head against the wall at 1 in the morning when you're trying to figure something out and you just can't find the answer, that's absolutely worthwhile to submit to. Now, at the bottom of every um, documentation page, you'll see something that looks like this. 
So just scroll down to the bottom, it says submit correction, and it welcomes you to submit it. And there's a form that you link to, and I tried to make it in a narrow mobile mode so you could see the whole thing. But then you could just fill in that form, provide your comment, and uh, take it from there. All right, number 17. Stickers are a thing. Okay, so I can see that Federico has lots of stickers on his laptop. I don't know if you guys can see mine. Um, I'm just going to lift it up and show you that it's got a ton of stickers on it. Um, how many of you have pristine laptops that are untouched by stickers? Oh, my goodness. So about 15, maybe 20 of you. And how many of you have lots of stickers? Come on. All right, so slightly fewer. Um, I will tell you that um, where I work in California, stickers are absolutely a thing. And one of the things that I think, so you can see the Postgres sticker down at the bottom. I actually just picked that up at the PG Day on Friday that happened here in Brussels um, at the Hilton. And that's an event that precedes FOSDOM every year. And if you're interested in Postgres, I recommend you go next year. There were about 125 people there, if I remember correctly, and um, just single day. Uh, single track, uh, all about Postgres. Anyway, so that's where I picked that sticker up. But I was on a train coming home um, a while ago, and somebody saw my laptop because I work on the train. I hotspot my phone, and I was just cranking along all in my own little world. And this, this man leaned over, and he said, do you work at Citus Data? So this, was, this must have been right before the acquisition, I guess. And, uh, and so it led to this wonderful 45-minute conversation all about Citus and scaling out Postgres and the extension. And, and it was a pretty fabulous experience. And I've heard that echoed by other people. They'll be in coffee shops, and they'll have a Postgres sticker, and somebody will come up and start talking to them about it. So if you don't like people and you don't want to talk to people, maybe it's not for you. But... <laughs> I, I think it's fabulous. And, and in fact, at the end of my talk, I do have some of our cool Alicorn stickers that link to our open source repo um, if you're interested in that. Okay, so number 18, use your design skills. Oh my gosh, I gotta speed up. Um, graphics and visuals pull people in. So this is that Alicorn that I mentioned that we make stickers of. We use an Alicorn because Postgres, of course, the beloved symbol is the elephant. And at Citus, we felt like we made the elephant magic by scaling it out horizontally. So we combined the elephant with the unicorn. And that's its history. Um, another example of using design is in Louise Grandjean's Crocodile. So um, she gave a fabulous talk at a bunch of Postgres conferences over a year ago about a deep, deep talk about Postgres indexes, very heavy hitting. But she used the notion of cleaning crocodiles' teeth as a theme to kind of connect the dots on all of her conversations about Postgres indexes. And it, it got people in the room. She had a crowded, jam-packed room. It also kept them awake. They weren't bored. <laughs> like, the, the storyline and her connections were very creative. And then here's another example of using design to help grow the Postgres community. Um, I just gave one of you a Postgres activity book. He's holding it here. I have about 10 more with me that I can share. But it's, it's a, a book full of coloring pages and puzzles geared at kids, although adults like it too. And it's just about promoting Postgres. So there's a page on multi-tenancy, and there's a page on analytics, and there's a page on discovery. And they're all kid-friendly. But they might foster a conversation between you and your kids about, well, what is Postgres? And what is a database? And mom, dad, what do you... What do you actually do at work anyway? So um, they're pretty fun, and they've been very popular. And they're not heavily branded at all. I think on the back we put with love from our team at, at Microsoft, but that's it. Um, so those are examples of using your design skills. Um, now, the other thing that I've seen more and more is people at conferences, um, people who maybe don't like to write are not going to publish blogs. They're more like bullets people. That's how they like to communicate. They'll create these things called sketch notes, where they'll put together a few bullets of the few main takeaways of a talk. They'll put little doodles on it and use some color, and it's very effective. So this is from an engineer at, at Okta, the security company named David Neal, or Reverend Geek on Twitter. And I'm just waiting for him to come to one of my talks and create a cool sketch notes of one of my presentations. Um, the thing that's interesting is there's a designer I know named Christina Wadke in the San Francisco Bay Area, and she teaches a user experience class um, for interaction designers and um, just general user experience. And she did a small A-B test. It's not statistically significant, uh, but where she, she gave one set of students um, the assignment 
of creating a sketch note at the end of each chapter of learning in that course. It was a semester-long course, I believe. And the other set of students did not have to create a sketch note. And the students who had to create the sketch notes performed better significantly on their grades for the class for that semester, which I thought was kind of interesting. And it might connect to the fact that using paper and pencil helps people retain information, or in this case, paper and marker. Um, all right, so number 20, evangelize at your local university. Now, this picture was actually the room at Fosdom last year. Um, so it was, as you can see, it was bigger. And Devram Gunduz, standing over here, is actually the photographer, and he posted this on Twitter. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, so I didn't have a good picture of people giving a talk at their local university about Postgres, or maybe going back to their alma mater, talking about how they use Postgres or what they're working on with it. But if you are, this is the fabulous way to contribute. And in fact, it probably will change the trajectory of some of those students' careers because it's the things that people get exposed to in college that often influence that first project that they join or that first job that they take. So thank you, Devram, for the wonderful photograph. And then the 21st way you can contribute is just once you are part of the Postgres community, which you've come to my talk, you're now all part of the Postgres community, um, make people feel welcome. I often feel like being welcome is one step, one more positive step further along than just being open. So if you have an open door, anybody can walk in, right? That's open. But if they have the courage to walk in, if they know they can walk in, and when you're welcoming, when you make sure people know that, hey, we're in here, come on in, we want you to join, when you invite people to join, when you make sure they got the invitation, well, that's just a much more positive feeling. And I have to say that everybody that I've met and I work with in the Postgres community does a good job at this already. I just think we need to keep doing it. All right, so that's the summary of 21 ways to contribute to Postgres beyond code. I hope I've given you some good ideas of things that you can do if you're just getting started with Postgres, ways that you can share your lessons learned, your pain points, your expertise. And um, I also hope I've given you some understanding of let's say you are a developer let's say the way you want to contribute to Postgres is in code I hope I've given you some understanding and appreciation for the other types of skills that we need in order to keep growing this community and um, raising awareness of how awesome Postgres is and before I end I had to put up one more amazingly awesome Fibonacci spiral obviously of a, sh a snail shell and this actually had two um, Fibonacci spirals in it so I try to draw them in in pink and white and I want to say thank you very much. Um, merci. And I don't know how to say the Dutch, though, or the Flemish. Is it thank you? Thank you. Thank you? Okay, I tried. Um, those are my Twitter handles if any of you are going to tweet anything. And I just wanted to point out that I will stand over there by the door. Um, or I can come to you if you don't want to give up your seat. I do have um, a bunch of pre-acquisition limited edition Citus Data Ellicorn socks with me that I thought, given that this is an open source community, you would appreciate. Um, I also have, like I said, some cool um, Citus Ellicorn stickers, and I have about 10 of those Postgres activity books. So those of you with young kids might, might get a kick out of those. So you have seven more minutes. I have seven more minutes, so I have time for questions um, if any of you have questions. So... And I could put that up again. All right. Why did I choose 21? Because 21 is part of the Fibonacci sequence. That's exactly why I picked 21. So, and I also wanted to go a little bit deeper than Josh did. He had 50, which meant he went really, really, really fast in covering them. And he did cover more ground. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about each of them. Otherwise, I would have picked the next number in the sequence. Question? Okay. Let me answer the question. The question is, I'm going to repeat it for the video. Um, do I feel like Citus Data has slowed down in shipping new releases of our open source software since we were acquired? 
Um, and I suspect if you asked me that question in the first three, four months last year, I would have wholeheartedly said, yes, we slowed down a little bit. We were a bit distracted, right? We had a lot of transitional things that we had to quickly figure out. Um, we have been continuing to ship new releases, though. So I think uh, 9.0, 9.1, 8.5, what? 9.1.2, soon there will be a 9.2. What we haven't been doing is publishing the release notes or the blogs as effectively. So I was just in Amsterdam a couple of days ago talking with the engineers, um, the lead engineer for our Citus open source offering, and we agreed on a plan to get um, more of those release notes published. So you'll see more of them. You'll even see some retroactively if I have my way, because there's lots of great stuff in there. And then we'll go deep into some of those new features that are in Citus open source too. What? <laughs> All right, any other questions? Uh, what's the biggest site of cluster in production and how much data it has? What is the biggest Citus cluster in production and how much data does it have? That's a really good question. I'm not sure I know the exact biggest. Um, I do know of a customer that I just wrote a blog post about myself where there's one and a half petabytes of data in the cluster. And I think it's about 44 nodes. Um, I know of another open source customer, again, more than a petabyte of data, uh, probably about 40 nodes. Um, I, if you give me your email address at the very end or something, I'd be happy to send you a link to some of those blog posts. Devrim? I know, I mean, I heard something from sites people more than 100 clusters. So. Or more than 100 nodes, you mean? I, I know the actual number, but I don't want to tell this right now. Okay, Just yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm telling you about some of the biggest ones that I know of size-wise. Oh, I do know of another one, more than a petabyte, and that's more than 80 nodes in the cluster. So I've now I've talked about Heap, I've talked about PAX, I've talked about Microsoft. Interestingly, there's a customer at Microsoft who was our user of Citus Open Source before we were even acquired. And um, he runs it on Azure. Our PAX customer runs Citus on Google Cloud. Um, obviously, we have now integrated Citus into Azure Database for Postgres, so it's a fully integrated built-in deployment option, so some people do it that way too. Um, and I, Heap has a published customer story. Theirs is a sizable deployment, and they manage it themselves on AWS. Other questions? Well, no Fidelity. question. I see the NLS for Italian is very bad, so I think I will pick up. That is wonderful. Okay, so he just made my day. Um, those of you who didn't hear what he said, he, can, he sees that the native language support for Italian is very bad, and so he's going to roll up his sleeves and start contributing. That is awesome. You made my trip to Brussels worthwhile. Thank you. And we all know Italian is a really wonderful, magical language. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> or crazy, well, as well, Federico it's, it's, says. It's the common language, but we speak any sort of language in any part of Italy. So it's a, but I'm quite fortunate because I live in Tuscany, which is the place where Italian is supposed to be born. <laughs> and it's still sp spoken in the way of the uh, so I don't know if you guys could hear Federico, but he's talking about all the different dialects and all the different crazy ways speak, people speak Italian in Italy. And he lives in Tuscany, so if you're ever in Tuscany and you want to talk Postgres, now you know who, who to reach out to. Um, any other questions? Um, if you're interested in more of the kind of stuff that I blog about or tweet about, I do um, tweet a bunch about the Postgres community. I'm at Claire Giordano on Twitter. And uh, thank you all very, very much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs>